looks fine. Okay. Right, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, okay, sorry there will about that. Probably be a few more people coming in. Um, so I am, as I explained to Derek yesterday, I'm, I'm not going to introduce him at all. He'll tell you all about himself better than I can, and I'm terrible at reading bios. But I, I met Derek last year in October, was it, at the at the Taba when we had a, a birding weekend organized by the. Um, uh, honorary rangers from Kruger National Park, and uh, it was it was a really super weekend. We got some really good sightings, uh, got some nice photos, and uh, so I asked Derek if he wouldn't want to join the, the, uh, to come on to learn the birds and do a webinar for us. And of course, I was hoping he was going to say larks, and he did. So here we are, Derek. I'm handing over to you, and I'm going to go off off on my video and off on my sound as soon as you're happy that we can roll ahead. Thanks a lot, other Derek. We keep calling ourselves Derek and other Derek. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation and to to the opportunity to share my love and passion for larks with you guys. Um, looking at it, I might already um, I might be preaching for the converted already. Um, if you're willing to listen to larks, then you, you must have been a spark or something. But I hope if you had your doubts about larks, at the end of this, you'll think, oh, wow, what marvelous creatures. So this is not a, a, a lark ID guide. It is just to share the amazing animals that, that larks are and my experiences with them. So larks are generally classified as, as in layman's terms as LBJs, as you can see here, um, together with puppets, the lark-like bunting, widows and, and bishops and so on. Um, and in case you're not familiar with larks, this is the only lark in this, this collage here, yeah? uh, Eastern long lark. lark. But uh, nothing much to set them aside, apart from the generally more chunky than, than puppets. <clears throat> I know people don't like those sort of vague terms, but um, you, you generally know when you're looking at a lock in most cases. Right, so in terms of a bio, I'll get to that just now, but when I explain how I got to, to be a lockophile. Um, but first, just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm gonna tell you what makes a lock a lock. And let's just get used to these controls. Right, so there are two things that set locks aside from any other birds, or so we thought. Um, and as it turns out, you know, some of these characters are a little bit dubious and shared by other species as well. So the traditional um, classification was based on the shape of a tarsus. This is for the tarsus of a Nicholson's puppet and this one of a pink bolt lark. Now, larks have a rounded tarsus with these scoots. I hope you can see the scoots, it's like scales at the back. Whereas puppets uh, have a booted tarsus, which means there are no scales. And uh, a scooted scale or a scooted tarsus is not unique to larks. There's many other birds and other passerines as well, the Tyrannids of South America, for example, also have um, scoots at the back of a tarsus. But the combination of a rounded tarsus and the scoots. And then if you're a vegetarian, uh, just look away for a few minutes. This is the other feature that sets it apart, the syrinx of a lock or the voice box. So this structure here is the voice box. So that's the, the trachea and the bronchi going down here to the lungs. And that this here is the voice box. Now larks have uh, five syringeal muscles, whereas most other passerines have six to eight, yet they are able to um, produce you know, very complex sounds like other passerines, for example. Uh, the only difference is the spike-heeled lark, and I'll get to that in a, in a second, as in a, a unique oblique muscle covering the bottom. Uh, anyway, we had a student, uh, Aluwani and Tangeni, a couple of years back. He looked at the syringeal morphology of larks. Um, he did his master's on that, and it was a, a very interesting project. Um, so just to get to that, he did these theological slides together with a, a lady in um, Argentina. So one of the defining characters of a lark syrinx is the pessilus. Now the pessilus is this little triangular shaped thing here. 
Now, if you look at the, the, the early literature uh, and the original classifications actually said that larks do not have a pessilis. So Mayer and Amadon Ames, which did a major taxonomic study of pessilis, uh, of, of a pessilis of many passerine species, they all said, no, no uh, pessilis. And it was based on McGillifray's publication in 1839. But McGillifray never said that. He just had a picture of uh, the trachea of a horned lark. So where they got to the idea that there's no pessilis uh, remains a mystery. Then the Joanna, uh, the birds of the world, he said, yes, larks have a rudimentary pessilis. But again, the references were, there was no reference to it. So Cecilia Kopichan from Argentina wrote to Prof. de Joanna, and he explained that he got it from Freyen. But again, if you look at Freyen's text, it's in French, and you translate it, it doesn't really, it doesn't mention um, the fact that it has a, a rudimentary uh, pessilis. Dean and Williams, in the same year as the Joanna, said, yes, it has a pessilis, but it's not ossified. And Aluani's projects show definitely all logs have a pessilis, and it is ossified to varying extents, but it is ossified in these logs. Okay, so there's a bit of a, a murky history in the, in the syrinx, and it's one of the major taxonomic features, but there's quite a bit of contentious issue in taxonomy. Right, so why larks? Well, it started, I must say that I, I think I'm quite lucky with larks. Uh, I always seem to be in, well, our paths cross at the right time. Yes, for example, a Rufus Nape lark on the way to Gauteng, displaying nicely, welcoming me to Gauteng. And I've, I've often had this feeling that I was just at the right place, right time, or I cooperate. And I've been able to uh, take that further and to, to do, get some amazing information on larks. Um, so there's a bit of luck involved. Uh, yes, one of the first nests of Barlow's lark in South Africa, but I managed to, to find the individual. So how did I be become a larkophile, or what we call it, you know, the love of larks? Um, well, I, I've always been interested in birds, but I was studying towards my PhD actually in conservation genetics. And I just at one stage had an early career crisis and I thought, well, do I really want to be in a lab all my life? Or my real interest was behavioral ecology. So while I was finishing my PhD, I had a fortunate at the time, a very nice line manager, uh, Prof. Rolf Becker, who is now in Namibia. And he was quite open-minded and I also had a, a great mentor in Les Minter, who some of you might know, the frog specialist. And he, he said, just, just follow your passion, go with what your heart says. Uh, so with the encouragement of, of, of Rolf and Les's wise words, um, I thought, well, the short lot lark, which at the time was probably the least known lark in Southern Africa. Um, I think McLean said that in 1984. So, I live in Polokwane, which is one of the strongholds of this species, uh, the short lord lark, and I started you know, studying that with the great help of my late friend Joe Grossel, who was the ecologist and, and manager of the reserve at the time, and he paved the way for me to basically have free reign of the reserve, come in when I want, do what I want, uh, studying larks. And eventually I got Joe to do his master's on short lord lark, I was his supervisor, and together we had great fun over the years, you know, studying larks, surveying short clawed lark territories in Botswana, Aga, northwest, the border with Botswana, and even here in, in, in Polokwane. And yeah, the rest is history, basically, as you'll see uh, later. All right, so this is a short clawed lark. Uh, it's a very special bird to me. It's in terms of larks, you can say it's my first love, and I still have a very very fond, fond of it, uh, and I enjoy working with them. Um, lots of information that we got over the years, reading ecology, calls, vocalizations, etc. So it still holds a very special place. But I've been fortunate to extend my work on larks and work some with very fascinating birds like sparrow larks, melodious lark, monotonous, a really sought after bird worldwide. Sclater's lark, Rudd's lark, Bertha's lark, and you know, just they 
the puzzles always seem to fall in place when I'm there. I always see something interesting or get something interesting. And I also met some great people, uh, two of my fellow Larkophiles, Per Alstrom and Paul Donald. They writing this book here, The Larks of the World. And they joined up with me, and uh, well, I joined them really. Uh, and we uh, went to the Northern Cape in 2016 so that they can get material for their book. Um, we've got 19 species of larks on that trip. Uh, since then, Per has been back. And last year, we did the savannas around Polokwane, where we got 12 species in seven days. And we did the grasslands in 2017, where we also got 12 species. But these are much smaller areas than the 19 species in the Karoo. Um, then I also have work, regularly work with two other colleagues and then friends, David Park, who some of you might know. So accompanied me on a lot of the collecting trips and he's quite involved in, in some of our projects. And my colleague at the University of Limpopo, Tefiwa Mandiwana, she also does a lot of, uh, well, we both share an interest in locks and we've, we've supervised several students. And then over the years, we've had many students that are somehow convinced to, to take locks on as their, their study subject. Okay, so let's look at larks and what makes it, what are the challenges that a lark face in terms of, you know, they all look pretty much the same as many people say. So if you all look the same, how are you going to stand out to attract the mate? Right, so how do you find the mate? How does a female look for between all the males? How will she select? And there's a, a couple of ways in which you can go about. One of them is to sport bright colors or what we call the extended phenotype, have a long tail, a big crest or something like that. Um, but a lark being ground living in desert environments, you want to blend into the environment. You don't want to stand out. So these features are not really options for larks who wants to be cryptic so that they can't be seen by predators. Um, right, so we can cancel out bright colors long tails, crests on, because you want to be cryptic. Okay, what are your options that are left over? So the extended phenotype and bright coloration is not an option for larks. Other ways to go about it, you can, you can be larger than your competitors, your, your, your mates. And many larks are indeed sexually dimorphic, either sexually di size dimorphic, like in this case, or dichromatic, like the Eremopteryx lark, black lark, and a um, horned lark with their longer horns and so on. So that's a, another option. You can go big and lo a lot of larks do go size dimorphism or you can do a silly display. Uh, we can just call it a silly display because many of these sexual selection displays, males have to do really stupid things to impress the female. And that is, as you'll see with a large bolt lark slides I'll show later, it's, you can say that kind of a display applies to large bolt larks, certainly. Ding. This is the song of Angola lark. And larks invest very heavily in song. It, it is one of their main features and they've been celebrated in poetry. Um, so, and it, it, it is typical of drab colored species like in thrush nightingale, for example, uh, well known for a song at night and so on, and, and larks for their song. So that is typical. So song, and I'll explain a bit more during the talk about song. Or you can engage in these aerial displays, which many larks do. This is a red lark song. And many uh, larks engage or, or take part in song flights, which in the case of some species can last about an hour. I've recorded the melodious lark once um, in song flight for an hour and four minutes. Uh, a fawn colored lark at Achenais dunes and Kubakoa dunes um, for 36 minutes. So these are long display flights during which I sing to impress the females. The only way you can be seen is if you are up there singing in flight or the females can hear you. So that is a, a sign of fitness to females. So if you're not out there and you can't be heard or seen, then you are not part of the select few that will get mating rights. 
<clears throat> okay, let's look at larks of a world. There's about 100 species, depending on which system you use. Uh, Clements, you uh, have about 93 species, 21 genera. And I put it in red, 353 taxa. So those are the subspecies. So you can see it's a tremendously varied group of birds uh, in terms of subspecies. But you'll see the subspecies concept with larks is a very contentious issue uh, in a couple of slides. Anyway, to, just to get to back to, to the larks of the world, you have a very skewed representation of most species in Africa or the semi-arid and arid regions of Pale the Paleo-Arctic region. The New World, one species, the horned lark, and up here in Colombia, there's a small population down there. So they only have one species, the entire North America, only a single species, Australia, for all its correct rabbit that and everything, but there's only one species. And then the skylark was introduced to places in Canada, the US, uh, New Zealand, also uh, Australia. So these are in the well, species that are naturally occurring there. The yellow means they were introduced. Right, so I'll get back to the 353 tax a, a little later. They can be found in any habitat from open woodland, but just logs just really avoid forested areas, closed canopy forest. Right, so in, even in this woodland, you'll find birds like flappet log, uh, sabota log, birds like those type of logs, but not many. Most logs prefer very open habitats like desert environments. Here we're looking at dune log in Namibia. Or high altitude mesic, uh, high rainfall grasslands in Mpumalanga, just the arid uh, karoo scrub. Uh, in the Western Cape, you have um, fainbos, and you know, as long as it's a very open habitat. But this is typical lark habitat. And then you also get the savannas, which is in Polokwane, um, open woodland savanna or grassy savanna. And this is the edge of a Kalari near, um, yeah, near Uppington, Camus region. Right. Now, uh, people call it the dark continent, Africa. I call it the lark continent, being, there being 74 species. It is a stronghold of a, of a family. And I made a summary of the distribution of locks. So in the Southwest arid zone, so Southern Africa, we have about 31 species of which 26 are endemic. And in the North Eastern part, you have about 39 species and 23 endemics. Okay, but these, this 39 is slightly inflated because it also includes Paleoarch locks that you find here along the, the Northern Sahara. Okay, North Africa. Right, so if you take Sub-Saharan Africa, it's probably 33, 34 species. West Africa has 18, but it also shares some species with um, East Africa. And then Madagascar only has a single species. And you can see the, the forest belt of Central Africa, the tropics, real tropics, have very few species. It's just too wooded. So there you get Angola lark, Flappet lark, rufous snake lark, you know, there's not many species there. So the two strongholds are the northeast and the southwest. So even though we in southern Africa have fewer species, not, not by much, we have uh, more endemics than in the northeastern zone. Right. Uh, we did a phylogeny which was published earlier this year, the most recent and up to date phylogeny. It still confirms the free clades, Alaudinae, Marafrinae, and Sertilaudids. And this is basically what it is, right? Uh, in terms of the Alaudid larks for our region, it includes large bold lark is for example one, the pink bold stalks, sclaters, that, that, those larks, and then um, the red cap lark. The Marafrids, typical rufous snipe, monotonous lark, melodious. And when we call in the louder larks, are Sabota, Karoo, Barlow's, and those ones. And when the Serti louder larks is Gray's lark, the Sparrow larks, and the long bolt lark complex and spike hilt lark. Okay, the closest relatives of larks, two very unusual birds, <laughs> the 
Nikatos of you know dense woodland areas, and the bearded reedling, as the name said, of reed beds and so on uh, in the Paleoarctic. Okay, so these are the closest known phylogenetic uh, groups to to phylogenetically closest to um, to the larks. Very unexpected, actually. Right, the distribution of larks, as I mentioned earlier, you have a northeast and the southwest, and you have this interesting uh, species pair combination combinations. So you'll get some species in the northwest and a very similar species in the south, uh, southwest and the northeast. Um, and it's believed that during the Pleistocene area, the period, there was a, a, an arid corridor that formed that, that wasn't really arid like in desert, but it was grassland, woodland, or savanna. And that allowed for larks to disperse. Otherwise, these, this forested region of modern day Africa really makes it unsuitable for larks to, to occupy. As you saw in a, one of the earlier slides where I said there's only six larks in that region. Okay, so these species pairs, for example, include dusky and the rufous rumped lark. Rufous rumped in North Africa, dusky down here. Um, Lieben, Lieben lark and the Rudd's lark, two very strange larks, one in, in North East Africa, Rudd's lark down here. And then you have a Spizochorus lark, Sclater's lark and Obia lark are genetically closer to each other than Pinkbolt and Sclater's that are basically share the same region. And the Pinkbolt lark is closer to Mask lark and Mask lark shares with the habitat of Obia lark. So you get these unusual pair combinations in the different parts of Africa. And it's believed that this arid corridor allowed the dispersal of larks to these different regions. And then the Pleistocene, when it's finished, it allowed the forests to, to return basically, and then it basically locked out the, the interconnectivity of the Northeast and the Southwest. Same for the sparrow larks. Uh, in Southern Africa, you have uh, the chestnut back sparrow lark, also in the North, but the northern subspecies, Melanocephalus, has the white shoulder and our one has the black shoulder. I, I don't believe, personally, I don't think it's the same species. Um, just wish somebody would actually look at it and do a genetic study because I, they even sound different, they look different, um, but I, at this stage consider it subspecies of chestnut back sparrowlock. When just to return to the or, or remain of the sparrow larks, you have uh, these sp different sparrow lark species, one in India, three in North Africa, three in Southern Africa, all sexually dimorphic. These males are very different looking to the females, except this one, which was Marafra hova, and genetically it is actually a sparrow lark, and um, it's monomorphic, and it's only found in Madagascar. So a very, very strange very surprising uh, finding to, to have this Madagascar lark um, grouping with these sparrow larks. And then you have the desert larks, the Amomanus from North Africa and Amomanopsis from Namibia, the gray's lark. These larks look the same, they occupy the same habitat, very hyper arid deserts. And there it is with the same habitat constraints selects a particular shape and form. And that's why these animals, these birds look the same, but they're not really closely related. They are in the same clade, they're part of the Amomanet clade, but they're on, on very different branches of the Amomanet clade. They just look similar because they occupy the same habitats. Right, let's look at a bit at lark culture, larks in the world. So where does the name come from? It is believed the, the Roman legion, uh, Julius Caesar formed a Roman legion from uh, in Gaul, uh, modern day France. Right. So um, they, the Gauls had the, the larks, they saw them as, they, they revered them as messengers from, from heaven because of their singing and so on. And many of uh, the, um, the Gauls, when they went to war, the warriors, they wore lark wings in their helmets. It was a 
where you can see. And in modern day, you know, for, for cigarettes, gall was, those are actually the lark wings on, on the gall helmets. So that is where, and, and um, they were called, in English terms, the, the, the legion was called the larks, and that is the Alaude. That is where the name apparently originates from, and that is a coin uh, of saying the legion, the fifth legion, and that is the insignia of a, a lark. Then in, in, in popular history, I mean, you get lark cigarettes, there's the lark bar, I think it's in America somewhere, there's even a lark yacht. There's a McLaren lark, a car, the Studebaker lark of 1963. And in many cultures, larks, come to symbolize fun um, because they sing, uh, you know, light-hearted, fun, uh, relaxed um, enjoyment, basically. Uh, innocent fun. That's what the, the general term means. So the Studebaker Lark was a fun car to drive, and obviously this McLaren would also be very fun to drive. It's a Lark uh, camper van, single malt whiskey, um, a chain store. There's African Lark, which is a freight ship. Uh, you can't see it, but there it says African Lark. And uh, yeah, let's just, this is very interesting. It's <laughs> a book, the lady is called Lark, but um, the picture is interesting. But Lark actually, uh, the term Larking in, in some languages, I think Serbian, for example, Larking is actually, as a sexual connotation, it means to have sex. Um, so in certain cultures, larking, well, the fun bit is not that innocent, um, referring to, uh, for example, having sex. <laughs> Closer to home, um, the Red Lark restaurant, as was in Brantley, when the hotel was still open, they unfortunately closed during COVID. Uh, and I had, a, had to have a, a dinner at the Red Lark restaurant when it was still open. Uh, and then in literature, uh, uh, in the beginning, when we logged on, I had the Lark Ascending playing in the background, which is a popular musical piece. It is really good. Um, then there's a book in an exaltation of Skylarks, which is a, a collection of poetry just on locks. I have a book in my bookshelf um, from Shelley and you know various poets through the millennia, basically, all on lock prose and, and poems and so on. And then I also have this book, Lark Mirrors, that I got from Paul. Um, and a very interesting book. It is, these are lark mirrors. So these mirrors were used in, until fairly recently, to catch larks. So in essence, you have a string and you pull the string and this um, spins in, in, in circles. And it is, um, there are uh, mirrors or pieces of metal or stained glass. And when it turns and the sun shines on it, for some reason where nobody can explain it, it attracts larks. Or, they're not only larks, but mainly larks, but also other species. And they basically come to land as if stupefied right next to these things, and then they get caught or shot or whatever. Um, it is a beautiful piece. You can, you can get them on the internet for sale, but they're a bit pricey now. It's considered folk art. Um, so there's few and far between, and, but they, and they're quite pricey. But fascinating book to read. Uh, on how they caught larks and how many larks were caught until fairly recently. And they were still being shot and caught, as you'll see in a second. We're a stamp collector, lots of lark stamps to choose from, from all over the world, India, Bhutan, lots in Africa, obviously. And when there's, you know, in, in human culture, there's this, although we celebrate larks in poetry and song, and prose and so on, it's almost like we're schizophrenic. On the one hand, we praise them, and on the other hand, we, we shoot them. Larks are very popular uh, culinary subjects in, in, in Europe. Larks on a spit. You get uh, lark pate in France. 
uh, and it's also a popular hunting sport. Well, I think this picture was taken in Hungary, uh, hunting packages specifically for larks. It's, I looked at the price, it's pretty expensive. But that's what, um, you know, the cultural aspect of larks where we shoot them well for fun and food, unfortunately. Well, I don't, you know, closer to home, there's the Polakwani, where I live. Uh, Joe, that I was telling you about earlier, he was instrumental in getting the short clawed lark on the coat of arms of the municipality of Polakwani. And this was what the coat of arm looked like. There's the short clawed lark perched on acacia of Fatelia Rimaniana, um, one of the local trees. Right. So that's a cultural aspect of lark. So many people always say larks all look the same. And I, I showed you earlier that to stand out amongst your peers, if you're a lark, you need to do something different. So one of them was to be bigger in size. So for example, uh, here we have short lord lark. Here's a male, there's a female. You can see males are about 25% bigger than females. So that's a, a good example of sexual dimorphism. Or you can go sexually dichromatic, like the sparrow larks, which I explained earlier. Here's a male and a female and their chicks. Okay, so those are, they not all look the same. Now we get to a very interesting topic, substrate color matching in larks. Now remember at the beginning I said larks have 353 taxa, different subspecies. And many of these subspecies are based on plumage coloration, not so much structure or anything, there are larks in certain areas that are perhaps smaller. Thinking of spike yield larks in Angola, they're smaller than others. But generally, the subspecies are based on colors. Now, larks have the ability to match the substrate, the color of a substrate on which they predominantly live. So, for example, if you look at these slides here, you have rufous snape lark on a pale substrate and the rufous snape lark on a black substrate, a darker color. Uh, the others account as when, and when you have spike yield lark on this reddish substrate here, and one on a darker substrate, right? That's fine. So they can do substrate color, color matching, and they do this by dust bathing regularly. This is a female long bolt lark, and I know it's a female. You'll see just now why I say so. She was uh, dust bathing, and larks do dust bathe a lot, uh, and. It is believed that with the dust particles, just like when you walk through dust, you know, you get a thin layer of dust and that helps you to blend into your environment. So larks do that a lot. But they do not have any specific. We actually did a study. We, we got some feathers from different lark species and uh, puppets and chats like track track chat. And we compared them structurally. There's nothing special about a, a lark dorsal feathers or feathers that actually captures dust. There's nothing to it. It is just the, uh, how regularly they, how much they enjoy dust bathing, which actually creates you know, more opportunities for dust to adhere to the feathers. And this is an example of a karoo lock, the dorsal feathers. And you can see all the dust particles. This is the same uh, uh, micro, so taken with the same microscope, 500 magnification. You can see all the dust particles on the feathers over here, which is responsible for the color. And here's a good example of color, uh, this cloaking, what we call cloaking, and color matching in larks. So just to understand cloaking, larks have uh, tremendously big tertials. So the tertials would be these inner ones, S9, S8, and S7. It's actually the secondaries, but we call them tertials. So one, two, three, they're very big. And you can see in the closed wing, like here, these big tertials cover the underlying flight feathers. Now remember, larks live in very open habitats. There's exposure to the sun, you know, UV radiation damages the, the feather. There's abrasion against the substrate, vegetation, wind-blown sand, all of those can cause damage to feathers. And lark feathers do take a hammering, as you can see from these tertials over here. Right. 
So to protect the flight feathers, these larks have evolved these very long tertials, which actually cover the underlying feathers, as you can see here. So the flight feathers remain protected or shielded from abrasion, UV radiation, windblown sand, and so on. Okay. Now, the, the tertials, <clears throat> unfortunately, take quite a knock. So larks have evolved a good strategy. So if you take, there are 10 primaries and nine secondaries. Okay, so the secondaries are nine. There are six true secondaries, and then we call them three tertials. So that makes nine. So they have the outer three forming a cloak, and they take the brunt of the abrasion and you know, damage, protecting the other ones. So about midway through its annual cycle, the larks undergo a partial molt, and they just molt those three tertials. Right, so it's a much cheaper way than to, to, to molt all 10 primaries plus all nine secondaries. Right, so instead of molting 19 feathers, they just molt three, and they still protect the underlying uh, primaries and secondaries. So come the end of the breeding season, then we have another complete mold of all the primaries and placing them, and then all the secondaries and tertials again. But midway through their cycle, they replace the tertials. And here you can see, these are what I'm referring to as the fresh tertials. Can you see? Beautiful colors, nice edges, compared to these underlying ones that are you know, very frayed. This is, the, this is S, um, yeah, S, okay, sorry. S8, S9, that one must still be molted. This is just a covered. Right. And you can also see that the tertials, looking at the substrate in the background and all the dust bathing, that they're pretty red. They match the soil. So you don't have to, mat to, to get all the feathers to, to match the substrate. You just get those ones to, to really blend in with the environment because the others are covered in this cloaking function, function that I was, was telling you about. Then you also get this interesting situation here, color, what I refer to as color mismatching. These are all Barlow's lock caught at the same site. So this is the typical one that should occur in the Port Nolith area, uh, subspecies pate on the white beach sands. Then you have the race, um, what's it called, uh, Cave. This a reddish brownish one. And then this one is a kind of an intermediate between the Barlow's race and that one. Okay. But they're all in the same area. Right. So in fact, here we have at one locality, you have what resembles well at least two subspecies, possibly three, in one area. And that just throws the entire subspecies concept out of a window because most subspecies are in a given or in a, in a locality, they're usually allopatric. But here you have these unique situations where the subspecies concept doesn't work because of a color sub, a substrate color matching that larks exhibit. Yes, for example, short caught lark, which is not subspecies, it's just a single species. All these were caught in, within 30 kilometers of each other. And on the white soils in the western part of Polokwane, you get this grayish cold form. In the red soils in the east, you get this very red form. And then the intermediate soils in between, you get the intermediate coloration. So these are, if you take these as subspecies, recognize subspecies, you may ask why aren't these for sub, considered subspecies? They look very different, different colors. They actually sound different, as you'll see later, whereas these look different, but they all sound the same. Right, so I'm just highlighting that the subspecies concept in larks is a bit dubious at best, simply because of this, you know, the color substrate color matching. The other problem that you have with, with uh, subspecies color matching is that females usually disperse after, uh, after the breeding season. And if she disperses from, let's say, white soils to red soils, She's going to match, for, will do substrate color matching. She's going to do the dust bathing, and she will be much redder than this. So she can actually change a subspecies 
from one to another across seasons. Right, again, the subspecies concept is a bit dicey. Then you also, to, to add to the, the confusion here, you have Glodge's rule, which states that animals in mesic environments with high organic matter in the soil tend to be darker, like this spike-yield lark from Mpumalanga. As you go further west to Namibia and northern Namibia, where there's less organic matter, greater aridity, um, the species are generally paler. So this is the same species, different subspecies, according to, to the general notion, but very different in color, um, simply because of Glodge's rule, an aridity gradient. And then you have this situation, this was in America, um, where in historical times, 1918 to 34, the area where these logs were collected was desert with pale whitish soils. And then it was in the Colorado area. And then they started agriculture, irrigation. There's a lot more organic matter in the soil now. So the soils have become darker and the logs in that area have become darker. So from 1984, these birds were collected between 1984 and 2014. You can see they are much larger, same area, but much darker than historic ones. So you could argue that this subspecies has changed legions over the, over the what, 50 years, simply because the substrate uh, color changed. Okay, so again, I just want to, to highlight that from a large point of view, the, the, the subspecies concept is a, is a very tricky substeck, uh, substance, and that's why subject, and that's why this 353 taxa. Okay, I'm gonna devote the rest of the talk to, to my favorite memories about larks, share some interesting footage I got, uh, interesting moments and so on. So this was a case, Eastern Clapper Lark, I was working with Darby in the Free State one morning, it was my last morning there, and I was doing some atlasing and I had like two, two and a half hours to spare. And I found this lark carrying nesting material, found the nest, I had a camera, uh, a video camera. And I thought, I'm just gonna put it out there and see, see what happens. And I got this. So there's a female in the nest. So this wing quivering is typical of lark torture behavior. There's a male coming. And mating actually takes place in the nest. So it's like a bower almost. It's a little bit later. Same female. Wing quivering. Calling a mate. It will eat up now. You can see that getting excited. So it's also the first instance that we know of where female actually initiates courtship. Okay, so that's, so keep in mind, okay, so this was, as I said, I have had some lucky moments of locks and this was one of it. This was the first known case of, of this behavior. Um, so keep in mind the wing quivering. So the next one is quite interesting. That female I showed you earlier, she was dust bathing. And while she's dust bathing, her wings are quivering because she's flicking dust onto her wings. And her mate saw that as an inter well, interpreted as an invitation to mating. And he ran very you know, tail cocked, started performing around her. He thought it was a mating ritual. Meanwhile, she was just um, dust bathing. Um, needless to say, she gave him a cold shoulder. And yeah, he just stood around and watched her performing sunbathing. So that was just a quite a funny moment watching these larks. Then, you know, the expression and an exaltation of larks, the plural or collective noun of larks. I was lucky one day to sit at a water hole in Brunfle, have a female grayback sparrow lark, Starks lark, black eared sparrow lark, and red cap lark. And I so wished. Just to the right here was a large bald lark. So five species would have been in the frame, but I'm quite happy to have a quartet of larks in my frame. Uh, 
I just thought that's a, a nice one to share, a nice moment having four species in one, lark species in one frame. Again, I must say, I feel sometimes I'm just a, have a bit of luck with the larks. Right, as I mentioned at the earlier, the beginning that um, I have a very special fondness of short clawed lark, which is my home lark, you can say. Um, it's also called, the, I refer to it as the people's bird because it is so closely associated with man and agricultural man that I think if, should traditional agricultural practices stop, short clawed lark will be in very, very deep trouble. That's how closely linked it is to, to people and agricultural activities. Um, and that's why I call it a people's bird in, in places just east of Polokwane where I live. This is actually a common bird, garden bird in, in, in some um, villages. It's just a close up, nice picture of a male. Um, so it's a very interesting species. I, I showed you the, the color variation in a, within 30 kilometers. They also have very different dialects. This is a Polokwane plateau. So from here to there, yeah, here's a scale at the bottom. So this is about 50 kilometers. So the white area is what we call the Eastern dialect. And then the green area, it's a very sudden line. Beyond west of this line, you get the green dialect, which we call the Western dialect. And there's no obvious geographical barrier which will you know, set the scene or set the tone for a, a change in, in, in dialect. So but this, it's a real mystery as to why this would be a, a, a different call. So I'm going to play the two calls to you so that you can, you know, listen to, for yourself. So the white, the eastern call, is a very simple call here. Yeah, this is A, yeah. You can see very simple. And then B is very musical with up and down tonal variation and so on. So I'm first going to play the eastern dialect call white okay and now I'm gonna play the western dialect you can hear you can hear short or lock but it has a very different ring to it, a lot more musical. You can see there, there's the green is the score that I played now, and the previous one was there. But there's no, there's no geographical barrier. It's just you go from one side of Polokwane to the other, and it's a different dialect. And how it is maintained is still a mystery. So we are busy investigating it. Um, Chippewa was involved in that study. Right, being a lip on, nesting on the ground, you're exposed to a lot of dangers. There's drowning, trampling, predation. And yeah, I actually have a dog. And there you can see the, the nestling. It's just lying there as the eyes. And the lark's first response is to remain motionless. They have a scriptic plumage, so they blend in very well to the, the grass, as you can see there. This dog sniffed and it just, yeah, didn't pick up anything. It lost interest and the dog ran away. So the, the chicks were fine. Uh, it's just, I thought I'll share that with you. Then this is my very favorite special bird i don't think it's alive anymore it was last seen in 2021 when i started this project the oldest known lark in the world was i think 10 and a half years in germany a skylark and the oldest known southern african lark was a dune lark i think of six years this one set the record to well 16 years at least I, well, it was 15 years, eight months between ringing, but I caught it as an adult. So it was at least 16 years old before it disappeared. And it remained in that same territory, four hectare territory, five hectare territory 
for 16 years. Every May, I went back to see if it's still there. I called that its ring day, birthday, ring day. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, 16 years, which is still the oldest record, a lock record, lock on record, sorry, in the world. Uh, I called him Mokhalaje, which is the Twana uh, word for old man. Right, spike yield larks, very cool birds, they uh, live in groups. Very few larks live in groups. So here's a female. So they live in groups of three to sometimes as many as 10, usually about four to six birds. Um, very interesting birds. And I'm gonna just show you this rarely seen footage of a female, you know, initiating courtship in the beginning, puffing her up like a little ball. As a male in the background. And they have a very strong group uh, cohesion. Um, they would defend group members, they regularly patrol their territories. And I was busy working with one of their group members, I was ringing it, and they just lay around the car while we were working and just waited for us to finish, waiting for their mate to be released. And they just lay there. Very interesting. So, uh, as I mentioned, they patrol their territories, and when they get excited, they have this beautiful hairdo, and their tails are cocked, and you can just see this attitude. And they usually have a sentinel patrolling the territory, perched on a bush or something to see what's around, look for predators and intruders, and you can see the daggers are out. That's why it's called a spike hilt lock. Right. And yeah, they, there was an intruder. <clears throat> and they were looking for it. And you can see, you know, I call them gangsters. They're really looking for, for trouble and they actually found the intruder. They pecked it. Uh, it managed to escape, but it was quite injured. And it unfortunately got then stuck in a, in a fence wire. So it got stuck and then they just hammered it, blows to the head and so on. They lost interest, uh, two lost interest. They were three pecking at it and then two lost interest about a minute or two later but this one just kept going at it and you know pecked at it and its head and eyes and different angles it then lost interest and for somehow I, I thought this bird was dead and it somehow managed to free itself and it flutter fly walked like like a drunkard to a, a culvert under the road where it got in and i Thought I'll go and check on it, and it was lying on its. You no, know, it just didn't. I didn't think it was going to make it. I, I think it did die actually. Uh, it's just to show you, you know, how aggressive Levi can defend their territories. The reason for the aggression, I don't know if it was a, a territorial dispute, if it was a male challenging for position, if it was a group member that was. You know, I don't know. We don't know what happened there, but this is just a case how aggressive spike yield blocks can be. Then I have this interesting museum study skin. It, the, the tag says trapped at the entrance of a reopened Meerkat burrow after gassing in a rabies investigation. So this was in 1954, I think it was. And in the 1980s or early 90s, um, there was a paper people saw, uh, somebody saw larks coming from a hole, a Meerkat burrow or something. And they said, okay, this was uh, the first time it was observed, which was true, actually. But I just thought, here's a record predating it by about 50 years of the same situation, but this, was, this, this bird was donated by the state vet to the Transvaal Museum, or Titsong Museum of Natural History, as it's called now. And it was given to them but little did the, the state vet know at the time that this is the unique behavior. So they go into these burrows during the heat of the day to escape the heat, or they go foraging for, for food in these burrows, uh, insects and so on. Uh, I just thought this was an interesting one to, uh, to add. Um, then there's a dusky lark, it's a local migrant. And if it, it, it does this funny wing flicking, it walks and flicks its wing. Many of you would have seen it. And what struck many people are these very strange looking um, underwing coverts. 
it's like a grid almost. And nobody's ever caught a dusky to look at it. And you can't check on museum study skins because the wings are folded. So a couple of years back, I managed to catch two birds on the Limpopo River. And well, <laughs> to cut a long story short, nothing exciting. It's not stiffened feathers as many people proposed. They are slightly longer and may perhaps just fall like that. But there's nothing special about these, these underwing coverts. It does give us a very nice effect. And it is possibly may play a role in, you know, disorientating prey because they do have a wing flicking when they, they hunt. But there's no special feature to these these underwing coverts. So this is for underwing coverts of one of the birds for that court. So they are longer than usual, but not by, you know, not by much. Um, then the sparrowlarks, like this unique picture of a chestnut back and a gray back sparrowlark. They don't normally occur together, except now there's a big eruption of gray back sparrowlarks all over Southern Africa, as far north as Zambia, Zimbabwe, the Kruger National Park. Uh, with areas that they don't normally occupy. Okay, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about chestnut back sparrow larks, my work with them. Now, if you look at the original description of sparrow larks, they were described as belonging to the genus Loxia. Now, the Loxia nowadays include the crossbills of the Palearctic, and they have these crossbills. And it's just a very strange coincidence that this female here, it's a young female, she had a crossbill. <laughs> When I got it, I thought, I wonder if this is the origin of the original Loxia description. Maybe the original specimen had a crossbill, uh, ends the name Loxia. But it turns out that um, in, uh, yeah, when the species were described, Loxia, the genus referred to anything that looked like a finch, really. Right, so here's the sparrow lark. I did a lot of work on them. I find them very interesting. They are sexually dimorphic. They exhibit biparental care. Always laid two eggs. There's lots of them. You get lots of nests, lots of material in a very short time. So ideal study subjects for student projects. The other species, which I'll also talk about later, is a pink bolt lark. Um, also, it's a sexually monomorphic species, but also exhibits biparental care, also lays two eggs, breeds at the same time. So it's a nice comparison species for, for with chestnut back sparrow lark. Right, one thing that strikes me about chestnut back sparrow larks is the great variation in their nests. It varies from practically, practically no nest, no cover. I don't know why they would do that. Um, it is so hot when they nest to very well developed nest with an apron, you know, big nest, big structures, clods of earth. Um, this one is just on a hoof print, the side of a dam. That one has virtually no lining, lying on rocks. And here's another one with a very big apron. Okay, so lots of variation. Why you have this, this variation is not known. Is it perhaps inexperienced females, young birds? Uh, you know, we don't know. There's still a lot of answers or questions about these aspects. Now, if you look in the literature, a lot of the literature will say sparrow larks have, um, they line their nests with cobweb and, and spider silk and so on. It's not really true. About in my area, only about 10 or 15% of the nests include cobweb. Uh, it's very rare. It might be more common in other regions, but in my study area, very, very few nests. So these are two exceptional nests um, that have, you know, cobweb binding the, the uh, nest material together. They're also very prolific, well, uh, pugnacious around their nest, defending with the nest against intruders. So here's a male attacking a red bolt quelia that got too close. He has a, a lizard that dared too close to the nest and it's being dive bombed. There's the chicks in the background. Uh, here's a family fight. You can see the chick screaming. The male brought the food item and the female, she wanted to present it to the male. So it was a big squabble between the male and the female, uh, pulling at it and almost ripping the prey apart. But in the end, the male gave in and the female 
took it and she presented it uh, to the chicks. Nice lark family fight. Then you also get these, what they call roosting pits. Uh, they roost in these pits so every night. It's not known if they construct a pit every night or just you know, hollow it out, but they sleep in these pits at night. And that helps to, you know, it forms a nice little cup and, you know, the dorsal area is covered and it sort of protects them a bit against the elements. So those are the roosting pits of sparrow larks. Okay, then we also did an interesting study, uh, don't tell the cuckoos. So we took, okay, the nice thing, we have chestnut back sparrow larks, pink bolt larks and red cap larks, all nesting at the same time, all with small clutches, more or less the same size. Red cap lark is a little bit bigger, as you can see from this egg here. That's a pink bolt lark egg, sparrow lark egg, and a dummy egg. So we played around with eggs and we wanted to find out, well, we know that larks are not parasitized by cuckoos. But why is it? Do, are they able to recognize the eggs of, or, or foreign eggs or can they count eggs? So we just played around and we exchanged eggs between nests usually in the morning, and then we return them to their, their, their normal nest. So we left it usually four to five hours in that nest. So if it was going to be destroyed, it would have been the bird would have recognized it. Anyway, so we played a bit around, we added an extra egg here, a dummy egg in some instances that looks very different to a lark egg that's not spotted. Um, we took uh, sparrow lark, eggs from one nest and changed up another sparrow lark nest and across species and so on. And to cut the long story short, there's no, well, no, larks can't count. Mm -hmm. They can't tell whether there's two or three eggs in a nest. And they also are poorly, they can't discriminate eggs. They just leave eggs, it's just there. Um, so the question has been, why don't they bound by parasitized? Well, we believe it's simply because larks prefer to nest in open habitats away from trees and cuckoos usually perch in trees from where they scan the surroundings to look for uh, victims or hosts. So that's why I say don't tell the cuckoos, but larks are poor egg discriminators and there are no mathematicians. They can't count. This was just an interesting uh, video capture of a Montague's Harrier. There you can see it is taking a sparrow lark egg. You won't believe a bird of prey that size would stop and, and eat a lark's egg, but it does. I actually got two video footages, one of sparrow lark nest and one of a pink-billed lark nest. Then I also fall prey to, you know, this is in this case an egret that caught a female on the nest. And I had a, a very unique case, the first of, of its kind of cannibalism. This is a female of a chick died and the female consumed it, her own child. It's just in, in simple terms, it is resource uh, recycling. Instead of throwing it away, you eat it, you know, you, you get the protein again. That is the reality of, that's a biological reality. That's not putting motion to it, that this female engaged in cannibalism. And it was also at the time, the first record of a lark eating a vertebrate, right? So even though it was her own, so that's a case of cannibalism. And then, you know, sometimes I get it right. This is uh, when I captured the moment a little sparrow lark chick fledged. So I want to share this with you. It's a very special moment. There's the female and the nest, is, here's the chicks. And that's it. There he goes. He's now fledged. So larks leave a nest before they are able to fly. So usually there's two or three chicks in a nest. 
So it's better for them to leave a nest early. So if a predator finds a nest and there's three in it, it's a big loss. But as soon as they can are, are mobile, they and they spread, the chances of a predator finding, for example, all three chicks is greatly reduced. Right. So there's an example of a chick fledging. And you can see it not nearly being able to fly, but it is mobile. And it will be only be able to fly this particular bird only in about yeah, you know, about a week or 10 days it'll be able to fly weekly. Uh, but about two, three weeks before it can fly any, yeah, you know, I would say two weeks before it can fly any distance to escape a locker file like me. Then I was also lucky to to find the, the easternmost breeding record of greyback sparrow lock some years back uh, near Messina in the Limpopo province. Here's a female, they're breeding. And lark males, uh, being the biparental breeders, I I also incubate. The sparrow larks, um, most larks don't. It's only the sparrow larks and a, a couple of other larks where males also participate in incubation. But the sparrow larks especially take their role very seriously. And by sometimes reluctant to leave a nest when their shift ends. And you find this situation where the male refused to leave. He quite enjoyed sitting there. And the female actually got onto his back. And this is a, a real case of dual incubation, biparental incubation. Both parents sitting, <laughs> incubating at the same time. Melodious lark. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting bird, best known for its song. Uh, and I was lucky to find the first nest of this species. There's an isolated population in Polokwane. It's so really a ghost bird here. It was first found in 1906, and then in 1909, and then it disappeared for 80 years. And then Joe, that I was telling you about earlier, discovered uh, a few individuals in 2013. And since then, we've had about one or two sightings annually. And in last year, I found the first nest of this, this population. So these are the chicks from that nest. OK, it's also very interesting. It was a Southern African endemic, so it's mainly the grassland regions. That's Polokwane, where I live. And under the B there, there's some red dots there. That, that is the Zimbabwe population. So that was the global range of um, the, the melodious lark. Then, in the 1980s, um, Brian Finch, I heard a lark, or there was a lark in the Mara in Kenya, and I, it just, it looked like a white-tailed lark, but it didn't sound like one. Anyway, there was a lot of debate, and, you know, every now and again, people hear it, but, you know, we, we're never quite sure if it was just a variant of white-tailed lark or what the story is. Then, uh, Adam Scott Kennedy, I think he's the next speaker up uh, next month uh, on, on this forum. Um, he suggested, I think about 2013 or so, he suggested it's melodious lark. People rightly thought, well, are you crazy? Because the nearest population is like 2,000 kilometers away in Zimbabwe. Anyway, uh, that set in, in, in motion, you know, a real attempt to, to get at it. And Stratton Hatfield, then, I don't know, 2018, 19, or well, fairly recently, found this Mara. It was just known as the Mara lark. And this bird sat on, a rock, sat on a rock, it produced a beautiful dropping, and Stratton collected the dropping, dried it, and then sent it for, uh, to Netherlands for DNA analysis. And then followed a major international, I think it was 16 people, seven countries or something like that involved to solve this mystery. And it turned out that that bird is, in fact, a melodious lark. So we now have melodious larks here. We have the Polokwane population, the Zimbabwe population. There's one of the Patlani flats that Craig Davies found in, or wrote a paper about. And then here in the Mara, up there, 2000, a big gap. So the question is, how did it get there? And it's possible that arid zone corridor I was telling you about earlier, but that may have been the case because this is a grassland species in the Pleistocene 
this would have been open grassland or lightly wooded woodland savanna. And perhaps after the Pleistocene it closed up and that relic population then remained there. That's one hypothesis. The other one is that, well, now who says, maybe in other highlands, maybe in Malawi, Zomba, wherever, um, maybe there's a, a relic population of, of melodious larks there. Who knows? So it's an interesting, so you have this, what we call a stepping stone. One, two populations, three, mm, question mark over here, and then the Mara population there. Right, so that's it's just a, a very interesting study. I was also lucky to find Rudd's lark nest. It's a very tough to find that, and there's a chick. And this is the only known footage that I know of, of Rudd's lark at its nest. There's a female bringing food. So this is a critically endangered lark in South Africa, restricted to the grasslands. Um, yeah, you know, very difficult bird to study, very few, highly endangered. So very fortunate to, to get some footage of this bird. <clears throat> yeah, when we're Rufus snake lark, very common all over Africa. We are, uh, the paper is currently under consideration. You must watch the press because the Rufus snake lark is going to be split into several species. So if you're an African lister, uh, yeah, look at your records when the paper gets published. Okay, so Rufus snake lark, like other larks, for example, flappet and clapper larks, do a clapping display, although it's a very brief one. Okay, now the question is, most people say it's, it's for wings clapping together below the body or even below and above. Uh, Paul Donald and I, we have our doubts. Let's just say it like that. I don't think it's physically possible for the wings to, to get that quick up and down, basically, to get that stroke. But I suspect there's another mechanism involved, possibly something like the African broadbill, where there's aeroelastic fluttering um, of a wing producing the clapping sound. So I'm going to play you this, what I mean. Okay, so that's a clap, and now I'm going to do a slow motion. So just by rapidly creating that, with the wings not even getting below the body, you get this flapping uh, sound. And I believe that a, a clapper or, no, or a flapper lock is just an extension of this, but it needs to be studied further. It's just, maybe I'm completely wrong, but it's just a hunch that I have and a few others. And also, if you look at internet photos, there's no photo where you can see the wings getting even near the bottom of a body, or at the top for that matter, to do the, to produce the clapping sound. We also compared the, the wing tips because you would expect during flapping and clapping that there would be a tremendous amount of abrasion on the wings, the wing tips when they meet at the below the body. And we looked at feathers of museum specimens, specimens we collected, and there's no evidence of excessive abrasion of a primary feathers of flappers and flappets. Okay, so here's a female at her nest. And yeah, you always think of male singing, but listen to this female singing. And that's from the nest while incubating. So imitating. Is it particular for example? So the traditional wisdom tells you that males only sing. So this here's a record of a female singing while incubating. And a male, I know it's a female. Uh, if a female incubates, the male was not far from where she was nesting, he was also calling. So this is a, in fact a female singing like a male. And then we also looked at art for ecology and animals utilizing it. And there we have a rufous snake block in an art park burrow hunting for invertebrates. <clears throat> then I uh, also found the, as I mentioned, the first nest of Barlow's lark in South Africa. There were two nests at the time north of the Orange River in Namibia. But as we know, Barlow's lark is now considered 
It's just a subspecies of dune lark. Sorry, listers. But anyway, this was at the time the first nest. And as I said, I've just had this, you know, I think larks are very obliging creatures. Here's a female, you can see her. I'm pointing at her there, where she is, sitting on the nest, and I'm within arm's reach of her. Just patiently sitting, waiting. That's the eggs and a chick. And then I, this is not a lark, but an interesting, this is a lark nest, a Barlow's lark. She was constructing the nest and a scrub robber came, scrub robin, and he just thrashed the nest. Give a larks a break. Just, he just took them lining out and thrashed the nest and then flew off. So this is a Karoo's scrub robin, for those of you who don't know it. And this is some of the first footage of a Barlow's lark at its nest. There's a female bringing food to one day old nestlings. So she's color marked so that I know she's who's who, the male and the female. There she's feeding it and she's going to brood it. So these chicks were one day old when this video footage was taken. That's what the chick looks like. They use this particular subspecies nests in the, the dunes close to the sea, the white sand, and you can see the, the white down matches the, the beach sand very beautifully. Very difficult to see them actually if they don't have their mouths open. And when the lark is a very common species, I really took my hat off to one. It was one day I was in Kruger Park. It was 44 degrees Celsius. The cicada stopped calling. Nothing was calling, nothing was moving. And I stopped and there's a sabota lark sitting at the top of a tree, singing its heart out. Only animal, it was amazing. All right, so I also have a tough, here's a, a boom slung. Uh, one of the, um, the most venomous snakes, a uh, hemotoxic venom, uh, taking two nestlings. And you can see the nestling, they respond to movement. So when the snake moved, it opened its mouth. It thought it was food, but meanwhile, it was becoming food. The trampling, he has a nest being trampled. It, was, it contained eggs at the time. And look at this for an unusual predator. So those of you who are not familiar with Southern African birds, that is a common fiscal to shrike. Um, you know, they normally take, they will take small vertebrates like lizards and things. And but this is, I thought, quite a big prey item for, for a shrike, but they are known to take that, but it's, you would never expect them to take a lark nestling. So there were two nestlings in this nest. He took one on day four, no, day three, and another on day six. So he came back for a much bigger um, sabota lark nestling. And when you get accidents happen, so yes, I call it a subloated lark. Um, what happens here that the female, when they feed them, like a, a grasshopper's legs contain very sharp points. And this must have pierced the trachea and air must have, when it breathing, escaped from the hole in the trachea to the lower skin and caused this, well, it's neck to inflate really. So, well, I don't believe in interfering. So I just left it as it is, but the good news is that uh, it deflated after a few days and the bird actually fledged it, it recovered quite well. So it looks bad, looks very uncomfortable, but this chick survived. <laughs> Monotonous lark is yeah, obviously my one of my favorites. It's my profile picture on some of my platforms. Uh, it's my ringtone, very nice birds. And those of you who don't know them, that is, and it will sing this call day and night for about two to three weeks. In the So where many other larks, uh, when they sing, they, they bring variation in it. All monotonous lark males in a, at a given eruption, it's a nomad, so they erupt in an area, breed, and then disappear. So in this case, instead of bringing variation, they all say, right, 
Right, guys, we have the same tune, same song, and we repeat it. The last man standing wins, basically. That is what it is. So these are real brutes of, of birds. They will sing nonstop. You can go at 2 o'clock in the morning, that will be calling. You can go at 11 o'clock at night, it will be calling. You can go 11 o'clock in the morning, they will be calling. For about two, three weeks, nonstop. That's why it's called monotonous law. So yes, also some first footage of birds at a nest. So there's a female brooding chicks and the male's gonna bring food now. So you can see the female has color marks, just so that I know sex of a bird, who's who, so I can assign parental roles. And this is the cool picture of uh, four chicks. We were very young, from about five to six days old, they leave a nest when the female or the parents come with food. They actually leave a nest and run towards the parents for food. Um, and then as they get older, they don't sometimes return to the nest. So they have a, a very short nestling period, seven to eight days actually, um, but they scatter. And if they're still around, the parents know exactly where they are. They have a high pitched peeping call and the parents will find them to give them their food. Now, I said to you, it's called the monotonous lark because it repeats the same call, but this is a collage of eruptions that I've recorded over many years. And you can see that every eruption, because it's a nomad, has a unique signature call. So all the males here will call exactly the same call all the time. So this is in the bale steel area. In 2017-18, that was their call. The same road, bale steel, the next year, a different eruption. You can see the elements are the same, but you know there are differences between the two calls. Look at this very strange one in the Kruger Park. Right, so even though they're monotonous larks and they're all seeing the same calls, it's very different in different parts uh, or, or during different eruptions. So it's, in a way, you can say they're not that monotonous. Right. Uh, okay, so I mentioned that these are the brutes. They, they just keep singing and singing and singing. But, you, you know, fatigue sets in. So the, the syringeal muscles also get fatigued. And then the syrinx, you know, the voice box, the voice starts giving in. So if you talk a lot, for example, your voice starts uh, going. And I've got a, a little recording here of a male singing, but he's now lost his tune. So he, it's, it's muscle fatigue. And you get, you know, like this call here, it's a high pitched. It should be there at that level. So it throws it in. Some elements are missing. Some are drawn out. Right. So things just go wrong. So I'm going to play it so that you can get an idea what it sounds like. Right, so there you get an idea. It's not the same, you know, steady, same call. That, that is monotonous log. That's what it's about. To produce the same call over and over at the same pitch, same volume every time. When you start slipping, that's when the males give in. And the weaker males vacate the area and they go and look for another area to breed. No, no sense staying around if you're not going to attract females by singing. Okay, uh, I was also lucky to see the nuptial dance of a large bolt lark. He is a male starting his wing quivering, female in the foreground. You can see him resting the, the, the crest. And the female started bobbing her head up and down. And there was a, a third bird here. I don't know if it was an apprentice or something, it just looked at the other male. And you can see there's a female looking. He's got her attention now. So he's still quivering his wings. And the quivering got more and more. There's the apprentice. Still there. He then chased it away and returned. And the female did a bobbing her head up and down like that. Then she started collecting nesting material. And that sent the male into a frenzy. He started strutting around her, hopping like he does there. Female did her wing quivering, hopping, hop, hop, skip, jumping around the female, and then they mated eventually. Right. 
uh, okay, this is second last one, the Botas Lark. It's a species that I'm most worried about in South Africa. Uh, it's one that slips under the radar. Um, probably together with rats, it is our second most, in my opinion, the most threatened lark, even more so than rats. But um, we are a dedicated working group working on it. Um, I found this nest uh, in a, a village. So the nest is just about, yeah. In between villages and houses, people walking around, dogs and cats, kids playing there and so on. And there's Per, at least looking at the bird, and there's a uh, the female on the nest. <clears throat> These are the nestlings, two different nests that we found in different areas. This is a nest of a, a, a park town prawn. Now they can be dangerous, they can well kill a, a nestling and you know eat it. So it is a dangerous, so the nest is just about there. So the chick is right there. There's a female coming. Knocks it back. <clears throat> okay, and yes, the other nest. Slightly different, more open. And this is just some footage of a female at a nest, feeding right around the nest, picking up seeds and feeding, feeding it to a chick. The last species is the pink bulb lark, very similar to um, Bertha's lark. Again, it's one of the species that I work a lot on because it, there's lots of them, they're easy to find their nests. Um, here's a chick they just had, you can see the down is still wet. And here's an example of one there's a millipede coming by. Look at the thread display, making it look much bigger than it is. Uh, it's just a photo of a female delivering food. And now you'll see our nest sanitation. The chicks will turn around instinctively so that they don't defecate in the nest because that will attract ants and the smell and predators. So the female takes the fecal sac flies away with it and drops it away some distance. And to finish off, this is the most unlocked sound that you'll ever hear. Um, it's like a, an electric short circuit is what I call it. Um, and I, I close this, this, this presentation with this view because it is such a unique sound. I've never heard something similar to this. Um, I just want you to listen to it and, and Appreciate this very strange noise. Not this one. You'll hear it. This is the contact call we made. Okay. Okay, so those are just, it's just the weirdest sounds. It is, uh, there's no lark that does anything like that that we know of. And the funny thing is, this has never been heard by humans, by the human ear. If, you're not going to do this if you sit in a hide nearby, or very unlikely. And I've had many, many hours of recordings, uh, listening to it, or, or watching behavior at a nest, and I, this is the only time I've heard it. So it's never, the sound has never fallen on human ears except via video. So this is just a, a very unique. So finally, I just want to, this is a, the most classic quote that you can think of. Uh, this is from Archer and Godman, the birds of British Somaliland. And he finishes the chapter on the larks where he says, for this reason, I have no hesitation in posing onto the younger generation of field workers that wise advice, advice given to me in 1917 by Colonel Stevie Clark, concentrate on the larks. Uh, and this is really, advice that I took to art and uh, all I can say to the younger generation is concentrate on the locks. Thanks a lot everyone. I'm sorry it took a bit long but uh, it's my passion. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I'll be online for for any questions you may have.
Thanks so much, Derek. Thanks, thanks a million for that. That is a fascinating presentation, and I think everybody will agree with me. Um, folks, if you've got any questions, um, and you have appetite for remaining a little bit longer, uh, please feel free to leave questions in the chat. Uh, Derek, do you want me to read them out, or are you happy to just go and grab them yourself? Um, okay, I can go up. Okay, so it'll be in the chat box, right? Okay. Yeah, Thanks. you can actually start Thanks. sharing if you want, um, and and put on your camera. Okay, let me get that and stop sharing and camera on. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, uh, let me let me uh, let me get the let me get the participant list up and invite you to. Okay, I can see the meeting chat. Okay, now you should be able to have made you co-host. I should have done that right at the beginning, but I forgot. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go through the chats. Thanks for your sharing. Thank you, Mary. Bernard from Uganda. Uh, yeah, uh, Uganda with its species, it's certainly on the list. Uh, I would love to go there. Uh, I just got a, a, a book of East Africa, Birds of East Africa yesterday. Uh, Thanks, Liwani, for fascinating footage. Yes, uh, a lot of it is luck, as I said. Um, no, not that I know of melodious larks in Namibia. Um, certainly possible. The Patlana Flats are not very far from there, and they, there are historic records from the Patlana Flats, but I'm talking probably 100 years ago. So... As I mentioned, it is a, a ghost species. They were uh, disappeared under our noses for 80 years here in Polokwane. Um, so yeah, if you always, when you get something like, even if it's a, a phone recording, try and get a recording with your phone or something like that. Um, it would be interesting. I don't say it, it's not impossible. Certainly not in Brandberg area, but very interesting. Okay, thanks, Rihanna, Leone, thank you. And by the way, Derek, your video is not on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay, now it's on. Uh, it was for a second. Ah, 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 okay, there we go. Now it is, yes. Right. Um, okay, thank you, sir, for the best webinar ever. Uh, wonderful presentation. Stunning presentation. Okay, what is the detail of book locks of the world? Um, are you still busy with it, Mike? Um, I know. <laughs> It, it, it shouldn't be too long. I actually, if Hans, you did the previous uh, webinar, um, he's the, he did the artwork together with somebody else. I can't remember the person. So Fancy Peacock will probably be in a better position. But I had Tom's with Paul earlier this week asking him for some information. And yeah, it is, it's very far, but it's not, it's not going to be in the next month or two. But uh, you'll, you'll certainly know when it's, when it's released. Um, give a rest of thanks. Ah, Jafira, thank you, Jafira, and thanks for your help. Jafira was my, my fellow Larkophile at, on campus. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for all her help with all the, the Lark work too. Yeah, so I think that's it. If there's any questions, um, you can fire away or you can email me. If, um, I don't know, Derek, I don't know if my email address is on there or if you want to share it with people. Um, I, uh, I, I'll, what I'll do is when the uh, video, because we are recording this and putting it up on YouTube, I believe, right? Derek? Yes, yes. We are putting a, yes. I, I, I'm oh, going okay. to check my, my list to make sure uh, that the speaker has given me permission to do that. Um, and what I'll do is in uh, the, uh, the 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 page for this on Learn the Birds, I'll put your email address there, okay. so people can just go to that page and, and email you from there. That that way you don't your 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 email address is not uh, open on a on a on on a public website unless somebody actually clicks the link. So okay, all right, yeah. So anyone's welcome to. To fire away and please send your, your footage, your videos, your calls, 
If you need help with ID, interesting observations, send it to us uh, or to me. I will lap up anything that has to do with locks, as you know. Um, so yeah, uh, please send it in and yeah, share share the lock gospel basically. <laughs> um, I see Letitia Steinberg. Yeah, um, yeah, there's a couple of people doing locking trips in the, in the Northern Cape. Um, yeah, so I, you'll have to send it to me privately when I can give you information. I don't know if I can you know, promote others and just now somebody gets upset because I didn't mention them. Um, you, you can, we, we all know that Etienne does uh, trips up there. Etienne, one of the founders of Learn the Birds has also the, recently, I think, done a trip uh, to the, yeah. to the yeah, this, Western Cape, but not the Northern Cape, yeah. Yeah, so the Northern Cape is not that many people, but there are. I know uh, Rick Nuttall. I don't have a name of his company though. He, I think Rick he does might be here. So Rick, feel free to type in your info in the in the chat if you are here. Oh no, I think he's left already. Okay. Oh no, but, there yeah, Rick. Um, yeah. Feel free. I don't see Rick. Well, the, I'm assuming that Rick is Rick Nuttall, but <laughs> it could be Rick somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, anyway, so there, there are a few people I can if you send me an a, a email, I can give you a, a couple of people to, to select from. Um, yeah, there's lots of, I just love a brown fly area. I was there in September last year collecting material, uh, vocalizations. So it's a part of a world that I really love. It's just a pity it's so far from Polokwane. Um, Ariane, into which PC will the Rufus Nave log be split it into? So I think, I think it's about five species. I know the Southern African Rupus Nape lark remains the same. It's for ones further north. So in, in um, Central or East Africa, this one's gonna be called the Sentinel lark. So there's, there's a big split. I don't, I just saw the final, but we, you know, the review has been done and we made our correction. So it's been sent in. Um, so it, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big, <laughs> split of species um i don't have all the details with me at the moment but it's it shouldn't be long when it's published uh and yeah we'll certainly make a noise when it is published because it is it is a, a big step forward in in law you know, understanding law taxonomy um from taxonomic point of view and you look at some of these they, it's amazing that they were actually ever considered rufus net blocks those west african ones don't even look like a rufous net block, but they, I think in the old days, if people didn't know what it was and it looked chunky, they just called it a rufous net block. But now genetics you know, has split it into several species. Um, so I can't give you a, the exact names at this stage. I, I think I suppose it has to be published first, but it, it is, there's quite a few. So if you, as I said, an African lister, um, and you've traveled extensively and you log the Rufus Nape lock at various places, you'll have to definitely get that paper to look at the distribution maps um, coming up. Right, I think that's the last of the questions and I think we will call it a night. And uh, once again, um, Derek, thanks very much for joining us on Learn the Birds. And um, up next, we actually have, um, a talk in July about singing through the noise, how helicopter noise affects birds. Um, and it's from, uh, from um, Karen Cruz, who works in Hawaii. Right, thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Derek. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your... Cheers. Oh, and by the way, if you're still here, Derek's gonna be on again in October sometime. We haven't finalized the date yet, but talking about some really interesting things to do with Robert's birds. But we'll tell you that story later. Okay. Thanks, Derek. All right. Cheers. Bye. Bye.